so glad that you're here this morning for our final message in this series, Is Christianity a Trade-Up? And I think over the last few weeks, we have decided that it is indeed a trade-up. That the Christian God actually wants something for us rather than from us. That he actually, as his word declares in Jeremiah 29, 11, that he does have a hope and a future for us that is better than what many of us have imagined for ourselves. In the first week, we talked about the fact that heaven, if you can go to the next slide, is a real place where real people go to be with God forever. And we talked about some amazing things about heaven, if we can go to the next slide, that heaven is far beyond what we could imagine. And we began to describe it in the way that the Bible describes it, that it's a garden paradise, and that it is a place, as C.S. Lewis puts it, where every day gets better than the day before. And we talked about some of the incredible things about heaven, but we talked about the fact that, first and foremost, heaven is about God's presence. Is it about experiencing the fullness of a relationship with the God who created us? And that it is experienced relationship with somebody who is perfect in every way. It is hard for us to imagine even how incredible this is going to be. Dwight L. Moody put it this way when he said, if we can go to the next slide. It is not the jasper walls and the pearly gates that are going to make a heaven attractive. It is the being with God. Now, the other week, we talked about the fact that when we get to the pearly gates, there are certain things that God is going to reward us for, if we can go to the next slide. It said that there are five crowns that we will receive when we get to heaven. For those of us that are following Christ, for those of us that are in relationship with him and pursuing the things of God here on this earth, there are five crowns that we can achieve. And yet it is not about what we can achieve in our own efforts that really matters, but it is understanding fully and wholly that we need to place our entire trust, if we can go to the next slide, in Christ alone. That we don't depend on ourselves, on our own human efforts, on our ability to achieve something, but we need to place our full weight, our full trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord to know that we are assured a place in heaven. It allows us to enter into a relationship with God here and now. See, God doesn't force himself upon anyone. He gives us what we desire. If we desire to spend eternity with Jesus, it begins here and now. We have the opportunity to enter into a relationship with God that doesn't just begin when we enter heaven, but we get to experience it here and now. And so in week three, we talked about the fact that Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God here and now for us to experience fully. That we can experience a foretaste of heaven through relationship with Jesus here and now. That our lives are meant to be a trailer of what heaven is going to be like for everyone to see. Because understanding how our relationship with God works here will create a greater desire for our relationship with him into eternity. For us to live with eternity in mind. That is why this morning's message is entitled, Your Presence is Heaven to Me. Because understanding, understanding how our relationship with God works now allows us to desire it in greater ways. Did you know that widows or widowers, when they lose their spouse, the thing they miss most about them is not a sense of humor or some particular characteristic about them. What they miss most is their presence. There's something about the presence of those that you love that causes us to feel content, causes us to feel whole, causes us 
in the same way in our relationship with God and our relationship with others here on earth to experience what God said when he said that it is not good for man to be alone, that we need to be in relationship. We need this because we were created for this purpose. And so this morning, we're going to take a walk through the entire story of God's relationship with humankind, right from the very beginning. And we're going to walk through right until we enter into heaven and what our relationship with him is going to be like there. And it began, as we all know, in the Garden of Eden when God created Adam and Eve. One of the things that I think many of us miss here is that we imagine that Adam and Eve were walking around in the garden and experiencing God from a distance, kind of like the Bette Midler song. But the Bible actually says that God walked with them in the garden, that he spoke with them face to face, and that there was a relationship occurring. Now, for many people, what you don't understand here is that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus didn't come to be when Mary gave birth to Jesus. Jesus is part of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and has always existed even before time began. And so when we have a physical appearance of God in the form of a man in the Old Testament, and we have numerous of those as we will walk through today, you will discover that Jesus was actually walking with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, And speaking with them. They had a physical relationship with God. So when Adam and Eve decided to eat from the true tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And selfishly break their relationship with God. God's heart was broken. Much like your relationship. And your heart is broken when your child strays and does something wrong. I love this cartoon. It says, it was a mistake. It's not like the whole world has to know. (laughs) Sometimes we don't realize the impact of our decisions on others, do we? The Bible says that it caused Adam and Eve to hide from God. Out of shame, which is natural for all of us, isn't it? That's our natural response when we do something wrong to someone that we love. We begin to hide ourselves from them. We begin to turn away. And this is what Adam and Eve did. Because God was walking with them in the garden. And so they actually thought that they could hide from him. Remember, it would make no sense for Adam and Eve to be hiding if God was in the sky looking at everything at the moment. But because Jesus was walking with them in the garden, that is how we understand how he was calling out to them. Where are you? As they're hidden in the garden from God. God separates them from his presence and kicks them out of the garden. But the amazing thing is that God provides the first animal sacrifice here. God kills an animal and provides clothes for Adam and Eve as they're leaving the garden. And he provides atonement for their sins, foreshadowing what he would one day come back to do in dying for their sins for all time. It was Jesus that shed the blood of that first animal. And allowed for the blood sacrifice. Now, people often say to me, Chris, why did blood have to be shed for the atonement for sin? The explanation is this. Life is in the blood. Our life is in the blood. And because death is the punishment for sin, blood has to be shed for us to be made right with God. That is why one day when we enter heaven, as we talked about in home church the other week, there will be no physical blood in our bodies. Corinthians describes, as we, as we read, that our spirit will sustain our body and it will no longer need blood because there will no longer be sin in heaven and we won't need it to sustain our bodies. But our lifeblood is what allows us to be atoned for. And so an animal was slain to provide for Adam and Eve to re-enter a relationship with God, foreshadowing what Christ would come and one day do. See, he longed for Adam and Eve to continue in the relationship that they had in the garden, in that intimate, very personal relationship of a face-to-face communication with God, an intimacy in relationship. But a love relationship can only exist when people are given a choice. 
Just like we have to choose in human relationships to love another person and for them to love us, for the relationship to work in love, so God created the law of love that we might experience a true relationship with him. To experience that, we have to choose to love him. And God has always honored that choice. God has always honored the choice for us to choose to enter into relationship with him, even from the very beginning. And so we see God appearing throughout the Old Testament in pre-incarnate appearances. Whether it was when Abraham met with God in the book of Genesis with two other men in Genesis 13, 8. Whether it was when God wrestled with Jacob in Genesis 32. When the angel of the Lord, also known as God in the flesh, spoke to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus 3. When Joshua spoke to God in the form of a man before his battle in Joshua 5. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ended up in the fiery furnace. And the three men are then, and then the, the Bible says that a fourth man did appear and protect them. And he appeared to be as God in the flesh. This was Jesus coming in and interceding in relationship. In Daniel, at the Tigris River in Daniel 10, as God appeared before Daniel, God was continuously appearing because the Trinity did not come into existence in the New Testament, but always existed in relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit with his people throughout time. God also had an incredibly intimate relationship with Israel. It began with Abraham being the father of the Israelite people. And God spoke with them and chose leaders from amongst them to represent what a relationship with him was supposed to look like for other nations to understand how to relate with God. And so God led them at times by a cloud, by day, and fire at night. And they came into relationship with him through the tabernacle, which was the Old Testament way of providing the sacrifices. And people would take an animal, and they would bring it to the priest at the temple. And the priest would slit the animal's neck, and the blood would pour out to provide atonement for their sins, because blood had to be shed to atone for sin. Now, one day a year, there was a special place in the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was held, where the very holy presence of God was held. In that time, the Holy Spirit was residing in the Ark of the Covenant. And one day, one priest, once a year, could enter into that Holy of Holies to provide atonement for all the Israelite people for the year. And they would actually tie a rope around that priest's ankle because so many priests, when they went into the very holy presence of God, would die instantly for not having atoned for their sins properly. And so they would be dragged out from the holy presence of God because we don't understand fully, really, how holy God's presence is and how sin cannot enter into it. And so that atonement had to be done correctly, but it was only foreshadowing what God was going to do through Jesus Christ in coming in the New Testament. This is God, why God came to dwell, if we can go to the next slide, among us. To provide the sacrifice, not again and again, but once for all time. To allow his death on the cross to provide for our sins to enter into relationship with him. That is what Christmas is all about. And Jesus lived a life that demonstrated and taught what heaven was going to be like to usher in and say, you can experience a foretaste of heaven now in relationship with me and it continues on into eternity. And he walked amongst us and he revealed to us what it was to have a relationship with God. And Jesus explained to us that through his coming, things would now change. No longer would people have to come to Israel and then to Jerusalem and then to the temple and then to the Holy of Holies to get right with God. But that we would become the very temple of God ourselves. That Jesus was changing the whole religious system to say no longer do you need to experience God through a priest, through the sacrifice of atonement, through an animal, but my death will allow you to become the temple of God. My death will allow you to become the very holy presence of God. 
will allow you to carry my presence with you. Jesus taught that we can no longer go to the temple to experience God's presence, that we carry God's presence with us and in us. We are the temple of God's spirit. You are the walking, talking presence of God. You are the Ark of the Covenant where the holy presence of God resides. What you look at, God's spirit in you is looking at. What you do, God's spirit in you is experiencing with you. You are a walking temple of God's spirit. When we accept Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection for our sins and choose to follow him with our lives, God's holy presence enters us. His spirit resides in us. He's not just with us, but he is in us, filling us. Jesus breathed on his disciples, scripture said, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They became the walking, talking presence of God. Where they went, God went with them. And then, as we know in Pentecost, God poured out his spirit in an even greater way. And they realized that every believer in Christ would get to experience God's holy presence entering them and filling them. This is how our relationship with God works right now in the New Testament times, that we get to experience God's holy presence with us. If we can go to the next slide. And the more you understand who God is through the Holy Spirit in your life today, the more you'll want to spend eternity with God. The more you understand how your relationship with God works right now will enable you to crave heaven to desire it, to long for it, the way Scripture says that those that are mature in the Lord will desire heaven more than this earth. Last week, I said we get to experience the fruit of the Spirit because of God's presence in us. The fruit of the Spirit is the very presence of God, the character of God that is residing in you. It's actually being given to you. And how we experience that is that we get a revelation of God's character in some way. Paul said to the church in Ephesus that I desire that you might get a revelation of my love, that you might be more loving, that you might be able to allow the fruit of the Spirit to be revealed to you and then through you in your life, that you might experience the fullness of God's character through you in your life. The spirit of gentleness and self-control is already a part of you. I know for some believers you might say, well, I don't feel very gentle. You need to experience the gentleness of God in a moment alone with him. To ask for a revelation of that truth and then that can be lived out through you into your life. Last week we also said that when the spirit of God resides in you, you get to experience a spiritual gift. Now, to each one, a manifestation of the Spirit. We talked about some of the very practical spiritual gifts. We talked about things like administration and, and leadership and some of those gifts. But this morning, I want to talk about some of the more mystical and spiritual experiences in the spiritual gifts that you can experience in your relationship with God. And the first is visions. A clear Message and an experience of intense imagery, sound and feeling when you're awake that communicates important information that God has for you and will be confirmed through his spirit. God may give you the gift of dreams. And this is an ability to dream something that God has for you or for the church in some special way with a clear message and a specific purpose. God may give you the spiritual gift of wisdom or knowledge. Wisdom is the ability to, to understand God's word in such a way that when you deliver it to others, new understanding is given to them in that moment. And knowledge is the supernatural ability to know something about somebody else without them telling you that in the natural it's a supernatural word from the Lord to allow you to pray for that person, to intercede for them, to maybe even go and counsel them at times because the Lord is leading you in that. The Spirit of God also manifests in the gifts of tongues and prophecy. And this is widely misunderstood and widely confused. But tongues have two forms. One is a personal prayer language with God where your spirit communicates with God's spirit in a heavenly language. 
The second is the gift that's used corporately that must always be interpreted. If somebody is speaking in tongues publicly, it is to be interpreted at all times. Meaning that another person must give the message of prophecy that the Lord is giving to the church. Explained very clearly in 1 Corinthians 14 if you want to walk through that. Prophecy is a word from God in the language understood by people. It is for the purpose of edification, meaning to instruct, to exhort, meaning to give a warning or advice, or to encourage, meaning to build up. Sometimes when a word is given in tongues, it will be in a natural language that we experience on earth. And in our church in Hamilton, we experience this often, where somebody who didn't speak a language would speak out a word in Japanese or Chinese or in uh, Spanish or some language they had never spoken. And somebody else in the congregation knew that language and would speak out the word of prophecy that was given for the church, which always lined up with what God was speaking to the church. It was amazing to experience, and a word to unbelievers where they would get to experience this amazing move of God where they would say, how did this person who doesn't speak this language speak this out in perfect dialect of my language? And God would reveal himself to people. 1 Corinthians 14 says that this is a gift for the unbeliever, not for the believer. It's actually a gift meant for the unbeliever. And so it's confusing to the unbeliever that it's not from God. When it actually is from God, unbelievers will go, wow, look at what God is actually doing in your midst. God also gives the gift of discernment that will help if we're trying to understand, is this from God? Is this just a person speaking out in their own strength or their own desires? Is this actually from the enemy trying to get into the church? Discernment allows us to discern what God is actually saying to us as a church. But our relationship with God through the Holy Spirit isn't just about discovering gifts that he has for us or the things that he has for us, but it's actually about giving us life and life to the fullest. It's about experiencing the fullness of God's Spirit in us in a way that allows everything to be better in life. When God's Spirit is in you, a sunset takes on whole new meaning as a miracle of God. When God's Spirit resides in you, the birth of a child is seen as a miracle of God. That life is actually sustained by him and made by him and that you are actually formed in your mother's womb. And that is why as a believer, life means so much to us. It's also God's ability to speak to us in our conscience. Your conscience has actually been given to you by God. All the jokes of the angel and the devil on your shoulder are actually something that God's put in you which is your conscience. And God's spirit in you speaks directly through your conscience to you about warnings and dangers that could be occurring. I remember Adrian and I uh, had someone taking care of our kids one time and the, the Lord just was speaking to my conscience that I needed to go home, that something was wrong. And I followed that instinct and I went home and I found out that the person taking care of our kids had given Sparrow away to a strange man who had come to the door. And she had uh, just no ability to say no to the stranger. When I asked her why she had given my daughter away to a stranger. And I said, well, the one thing you have to do in taking care of my kids is be able to protect my kids. And God revealed that to me, allowed me to go and to get my daughter and protect her in that situation. But I believe that God speaks to our conscience through many ways. I know just the other day, Jay was saying to me that uh, you need to do this thing on your roof. And I just really felt like the Lord was actually speaking. And then a huge storm came the next week. And if I hadn't done it, I really believed that my roof, there was a big damaged spot on my roof and I wouldn't have got it repaired. But I believe that God was speaking to me through Jay in that time. And I believe that, that when we listen and we have to learn how to listen to God's voice, when God's speaking to our conscience in a small, still voice. It's also God's spirit in us that convicts us of sin, that leads us and says, this is the moral will of God for you, or this is not the moral will of God for you. It allows you to move in the direction that God would have for you in your life, or to move away from those things that God would desire you to move away from. The spirit of God is also our counselor. 
It allows us to be our advocate and counselor, that God will actually comfort you. 2 Corinthians 1 talks about the fact that he is the God of all peace who comforts us in our time of need so that we might be of comfort to others. He gives us wise counsel and decision-making ability far beyond what we can do naturally. The Spirit of God is also the revealer of all truth. The Bible actually tells us that as believers, we're going to understand God's word more than those that don't know Christ. And so the Bible is confusing to them oftentimes. Now, I know for some of you, you're saying, well, the Bible is confusing to me. Stop reading the King James Version. You're confused about the English, not the Bible. (laughs) You need to get a modern translation that you can actually understand. So you're not confused about the English that you're reading, but you're actually reading a translation that you can understand. Because God's Spirit in you will allow you to understand His Word. The Holy Spirit also guides us in our lives with an overwhelming sense of peace and joy. God directs our path and allows us to know when He is moving through an overwhelming sense of peace and joy. The Spirit also gives us boldness. Fear comes from the enemy of our souls, but God's word declares in 2 Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power that rose Jesus from the dead, of love that allowed him to go to the cross for us, and of a sound mind that renews us daily in understanding what God would actually want for us. You see, God doesn't force himself upon anyone, but he confirms through his spirit that you are sealed with God's spirit and that he will hold on to you until the day that he returns and you enter into relationship with him on the other side of heaven for all eternity. That you are in a relationship with God, that's what it confirms. God doesn't force himself upon anyone. He gives you what you desire. And if you desire to be in a relationship with him, if you desire to spend time with him here, you're going to spend time with him there. Because you're choosing, you're making the choice to enter into a love relationship with God here and now. And God will honor your choice. Because heaven is first and foremost about being in God's presence. It's about experiencing relationship with him. So again, I will say this. Understanding how our relationship with God works here will create a greater desire for our relationship with him for all eternity. We learn about that relationship through studying God's word and understanding how people throughout the time have learned to be in relationship with God, have learned about the character of God and how he interacts with people. But we also learn about it through our relationships here in the church and in our marriage relationships. Paul said this in Ephesus. He said that your marriage relationship is supposed to be the closest representation of what your relationship with God will be like for all eternity. It's a foretaste, it should be, an experience of what it's going to be like. And we learn to be faithful the way that God will be forever faithful to us. We learn to be unconditionally loving to our spouse in the way that God is unconditionally loving to us. We learn to be kind the way that God is kind to us even when we aren't kind to him. We learn to be faithful even when someone else is unfaithful. We learn, we learn about what it is to be in a relationship with God when we do the things that God would do for us when we don't deserve it to our spouse when they don't deserve it. In the future in heaven, when we live on earth, God will dwell in the new Jerusalem. And we will get to experience a relationship with him where he walks among us. Where he actually walks in the capital city of heaven. And we can walk the streets with him and talk with him the way that he did in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. We'll get to walk face to face with him, learn from him, and ask questions. We'll have a perfect relationship with him. It's hard to imagine what it's going to be like. But if you can imagine a relationship of perfect love, where you have no fear... You have full confidence in him and he has full confidence in you. It's a relationship of complete, unconditional love. Being fully known and still loved. 
being fully made complete in your relationship with him. It is perfect peace, no anxiety, no stress, true contentment in your relationship with him. It's perfect joy. Remember going down as a child on Christmas morning and being in complete awe of the presence. Can you imagine the generosity of God poured out on you for all eternity? How amazing that's going to be. How in awe you're going to be. It's all out rejoicing like your team just won the Stanley Cup or the Grey Cup or the World Cup or whatever it is that you connect with in that. But it's all out rejoicing in that moment. It's perfect kindness, unfathomable generosity, pure motives in his generosity and kindness towards us. There have been moments in my life where God did things that overwhelmed me with his kindness through another human being. And I thought, wow, this is just a small taste of what God is going to do for us in heaven for all eternity. It is perfect faithfulness, never feeling lonely ever again, always being supported, always being fulfilled by him. And the amazing thing about this is that it begins now, if we can go to the next slide. It begins now. The more you understand who God is, the more time you'll want to spend with him. The more you'll want to enter into relationship with him every day. This week in home church, we're going to partake of communion together in home church, and we're going to take time to just be in the presence of God and to experience what it's like to be in relationship with him, to partake with one another in prayer and to ask God to move in and amongst us. Because the more we understand his presence today, the more we'll long to be with him. If you get nothing else out of this this morning, it's this. The more you understand who God is, the more time you'll want to spend with him. Desiring time with Jesus here will allow you just to be closer with him for all eternity. Because you've chosen it when you had the ability to choose it. When you had the ability to choose to love him. When you had the ability to choose to serve him. Now is the time to respond to his presence. And say, God, I desire to be in relationship with you right now. And to understand that it goes on into eternity. It doesn't begin when I die, but I get to experience your presence here and now and carry it on with me into eternity. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are a God who enters into relationship with us here and now. That it isn't just when we die in heaven that we get to experience your presence, but we get to experience a foretaste of your presence here and now that carries on with us into eternity and will be fully realized in all its glory when we enter the other side. But here and now, God, we get to experience your love and your joy and your peace, your kindness and your goodness, your gentleness and your faithfulness in our lives, your self-control. And God, we pray that we get a revelation of these things in our life, that we might understand who you are more fully and be drawn into your presence with a longing to be with you. God, would you stir in us a longing to be with you again? In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. If we can go to the next slide. As usual, we're going to open the floor for questions, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up because we're going to close with the song, Your Presence is Heaven to Me, this morning. But as the team's coming, what questions do you have this morning about what we're talking about? questions this morning. Good morning, Pastor Chris. Um, it might be helpful for uh, you just to comment very briefly 
on the difference between this message and the prosperity gospel. Okay. The prosperity gospel is a teaching that uh, when you ask for something from God, you're uh, assuming that God has to respond to you. So you're placing God in the position of being your heavenly bellboy, that he has to respond to whatever you ask, and you're taking over the position of God and saying that um, whatever I tell God, God has to respond to. And this message is saying that God's presence is in you, but you're not God. So you don't take the position of God and get to determine the things that God would say. Um, So New Age, and really the prosperity gospel that's taught throughout TV evangelists, is that um, I declare it, I said this, so therefore God has to do it, because I am now mini-God. When the reality is, is that God's presence is in you, but God is still God. And if you choose to sin, you're still making a choice to move away from God. You're still, if you choose to do something that is not what God wants or God's desire. And we're talking next week about God's providential will, God's moral will, and how that leads to God's personal will. And we talked about that earlier in the series. Um, So we'll understand that a little bit more. But I think understanding that you have God's presence in you, but you're not God. (laughs) And... uh, that's, that's a very important distinction. And so just because you say something or you ask for something doesn't mean that God has to give it to you. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions that people have this morning? Jason has a question. Again. Again, um, so you mentioned that um, I, I think in one of the past um, sermons you mentioned that there was there was jealousy in heaven, yeah. right? Yeah. And on the slide, the last slide here, um, you mentioned that um, the time you commit here in in, in following God God's will and so on allows you to spend. Like, I got the impression that it's proportionate to the amount of time you get to spend with him in heaven. So I guess in, in, I'm a little confused. How can, there be, uh, how can there be jealousy? And is it that the, basically the better you do here, the more you, time you get to spend with God? So is there like an inner circle that you're... Well, there's like, with... people that are going to be living in the capital city of Jerusalem. And there will be those living in outskirts cities and those living in the countryside. So there will be some that are actually closer to Jesus than others in heaven, for sure. Now, the jealousy that we experience in heaven is not like the jealousy here on earth. It's a pure and perfect jealousy. And so its motives are are not, like God is a jealous God and his character doesn't change just because uh, the earth doesn't exist in this form anymore. And so jealousy exists in that God longs for all of us to be in relationship with him. And there's a jealousy in terms of God's desire to, uh, for us to be fully devoted to him. And that jealousy will be fulfilled in heaven as opposed to um, unfulfilled as we experience it now. So it's, it's a pure jealousy as opposed to an impure jealousy that we would experience in our relationship with others here on earth. So it's, there's a purity in it um, that we can't experience here on the side of heaven. But God char- God's character doesn't change. In heaven, God isn't jealous now and then not jealous once we get to heaven. God is unchanging. That's an important piece to understand. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, what would he be jealous of when we're there? Um, Because here he's jealous for us because we tend to, um, as like scripture put it, prostitute ourselves to this world. Yeah. Um, and so he's jealous of what we choose to give ourselves to here and to spend our time loving here. But in heaven, when we have perfect relationship with him, we're not going to be running after sinful things like that. So I was just wondering, like his nature doesn't change, but I always understood it as him not having anything to be jealous of because we have perfect relationship with him. Absolutely. But I think the part that we don't understand is how jealousy can be redeemed and pure and how uh, jealousy can just be, 
a longing to constantly be with somebody. And we, we see jealousy as, as moving away from something and it's kind of this conflict jealousy is in our mind. But what jealousy looks like without conflict, I, I don't know that we can fully... That's one of those things that we understand in part and we'll understand fully later, I think. Um, it's like... Uh, I mean, we understand love really in, in a very small amount right now, but we'll understand it more fully later on. And, uh, and so what pure jealousy looks like, I, I really don't understand myself. So, yeah, great question, though. Debbie's over here, Richard. Her hand up. really a question but kind of what he, the drummer guy I don't know your name sorry sure. Jason said was he thought that it was proportionate the time we spend here is proportion equals the time we spend but yeah you didn't really say I, I, I don't I don't know if I don't I don't think uh, and maybe I shouldn't have used an equal sign on the slide yeah. I was just trying to show that there was a relationship in terms of our desire to spend time with them and our ability to spend time with them later right that that somehow our relationship here does continue on into eternity. And so the choice to choose those things today will somehow affect our relationship with him in the future. It doesn't determine whether we get to spend time with him no, at all. I mean, <laughs> salvation is placing your trust in him. That's what allows you to enter heaven. It, it is not by works that you are saved, but by faith alone in placing your full confidence and trust in him and his death on the cross and resurrection. But our ability to choose to spend time with him here and choose to be in relationship with him here will affect our relationship into eternity. And so, you know, and maybe the picture is that certain people will be living in that new Jerusalem and we know that that goes up, um, you know, what is it, the half the width of Canada up past the clouds into the sky in terms of the size of the capital city of Jerusalem that we talked about in week one and uh, in this series. And so the, the city's going to be huge, and there's going to be probably billions of people that live in it, um, or at least millions. And, uh, but there will be other places that people, you know, and I would imagine that, you know, I don't know, but, you know, this is a personal opinion. I would say that somebody that accepts Christ on their deathbed, but hasn't chosen to live their life for him, may not be living in the New Jerusalem. Maybe they're going to be, they're going to be totally content and happy exactly where they are, wherever they're living in heaven. But uh, there may be, you know, Mother Teresa may get a better seat than you and me. <laughs> a better address. Yeah. I think one of the things that uh, we all think is that um, God is fair in that fairness is if God gave this to one person, he has to give that to another. And that is not the character of God at all. God does reward those who steward what he's given here well. And he does give more to them. And it, it's very clear. And so I know you understand that, Debbie, but I think just to expand that a little bit, yeah. And that's the way it'll be in heaven as well, that we won't all be rewarded the same. So, and there may be even a tinge of pure jealousy in that, in that somebody else has received a closer place to God than you have, and there's a pure jealousy in that it's a longing to be with Jesus. So that would be a pure jealousy, a longing to be closer to him and not having the ability to do that. So there may be a pure jealousy in that way. Yeah. Why don't we stand and take a moment to just be in the presence of God through worship to call out to him and to, uh, to invite his presence. Jesus, we invite your presence here in a way that John 17 talks about in the unity of believers that you'll come in a special way. God, we claim that promise this morning, asking for your presence to come in a very real and tangible way to us, that we might experience you amongst us, Lord. Hear our cry this morning, Jesus. Your presence is heaven.